Good morning and welcome to the McCown Road United.
Good morning. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, if there's any children interested in Sunday school, Mrs. Keene is right back there. You can go with her right now. You'll be dismissed, and uh, it's good to see you all. Yeah, it's good to have a start to Sunday school again, too, these little glimpses of returning. But uh, we do it with caution as the COVID continues to uh, haunt us on a daily basis. Um, I have a prayer for Dorothy Ellenwood's sister, who is in Indianapolis in the hospital. She's been there four weeks for COVID and very fatigued and um, struggling with the after effects and the healing of COVID. So uh, we lift her in prayer and pray for her healing. Um, and for all those who may be affected in dealing with COVID, I, I know there's a gentleman in uh, Florida, Indiana that uh, Brian Tanner, I received, I seen prayers for him and he's in the hospital in Tennessee and not doing well. So we lift up Brian for healing mercies as well. Um, do you have any prayers that you'd like to lift up this morning? Or uh, Let's start right there. Go ahead, Frank. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Chris Visker's brother, Ed, passed away. So for the Visker family, we keep them in our prayers for, for comfort and peace in this difficult time. And as they prepare to celebrate his life, um, we pray for them and lift them up. Yes. Your daughter Heidi, we lift her up and uh, pray for her health and God to strengthen her and, and heal her um, as well. Are there any online or any other ones that we got here? Let's see, go ahead, right over there, yes. Is your cousin Todd, what was it? Oh, passed away from cancer. Lift that in prayer, left you in prayer in the family. Um, as you uh, also grieve your loss and, and celebrate his life. Um, it's difficult, yes. Um, are there others? I see another hand back there. Or... Yes. Yes, you. What was her name again? Sandy's sister and Denise, and uh, we pray for <clears throat> the doctors and the nurses that are caring for her and, and diagnosing and trying to, and just uh, pray for her and God's strength to be with her and for all of you, as it's tough when our family members are going through those kinds of diseases and illnesses and uh, seeking some kind of diagnosis that doesn't seem to come. That's hard, hard. So uh, we lift that up and we lift you up. Any others this morning? Yes, Kellen. For your older sister with health concerns and struggling as well, huh? God bless her. We lift her up, Helen, and pray for God's uh, strength and peace and comfort to be with her also. Um, you have one, yes. yes. My, uh, no, yes. Um, my grandnephew, who's 11, his leg was turning the wrong way, so they had to cut his femur and return it back for him. So just praying for quick recovery and no addiction to opioids. <laughs> yeah, and healing. Yes, yeah, and healing. Yeah. That does the job. God bless him. Yeah, we will be lifting that in prayer. Definitely, Noreen, thank you. Any others? Have a lot of prayers and concerns on our hearts, don't we? Um, I, a little birdie told me it was somebody's birthday this week. 
uh, Elizabeth, you know whose birthday it was? Huh? Happy birthday. God is good. You try to be sneaky and quiet and shy down there. Don't you worry. I'll find out what's going on, lady. God bless you. Yeah, praise God. Happy birthday. And uh, uh, thank God that all that goes on yesterday, everything will calm Jesus' name. I was praying that nobody takes time to get out of the way to remember those who have lost their blessings. Amen. Yes, we do. We'll give tribute to those folks today, as a matter of fact. So uh, let's take some time and just um, lift our prayers up together, those silent prayers, unspoken prayers, and just take uh, some moment as we contemplate and pray before God together. Gracious God, we come before you this morning with a plethora of concerns and joys, and we lift them before you as your children, and you've heard the prayers that have been spoken for our brothers and sisters, for family members and friends, for those who have lost loved ones, we pray for you to comfort them, and, and Lord, give them the strength and peace that they need in the days ahead. For those dealing with COVID and diseases that are uh, causing them to be fatigued and, and just lose hope a lot of days, Lord, give them your hope and speak words of healing to them as well and, and give them the encouragement that they need to uh, take one day at a time and this healing process continues. Pray for those who had surgeries and procedures and and for this young man with the, the foot surgery and protect him from the opioids and let him come through this and know newness and fullness of life. Um, Lord, we pray that we may find peace as we lift our prayers before you and may trust in, in your goodness, trust in your faithfulness. Lord, that you always answer our prayers oftentimes in ways that we don't understand or don't even know. But we thank you for that. And today we thank you for all those who came together on the attacks of 9-11-2001 and pray for the families who lost loved ones during that attack, Lord, and for the heroism and for the unity that we experienced during that time, Lord. We pray that that may be our motto as we move forward that we never forget, Lord. So we come before you with grateful hearts this morning, lifting up our prayers, our joys, our concerns, and praying together as Jesus taught us, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21, and then Romans 13, verses 9 through 10. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the presence of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Romans 13, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. May the Lord bless today our reading, our understanding, and our hearing of these his holy words. Thank you. So as we commemorate this uh, 20th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11, I'm going to lift up a message today, and the title of the message is, What About Then? What About Now? As we reflect on these 20 years. And any of us who were alive in 2001 remember exactly where we were and exactly what we were doing when we heard the news about the attacks on the World Trade Center. It has become the defining moment of this generation. It's a lot like the attack of Pearl Harbor was in the 1940s and the Kennedy assassination in the 60s. With 2001 being the 20th anniversary of this tragic event, several of the networks and news outlets have already presented numerous retrospective shows. Many communities, held memorial services yesterday and today and throughout this weekend. And you know, I've been thinking about this for several weeks. What do we do um, with the 20th as it comes up? Seeking God, trying to discern what is God's word for us today? We know what happened 20 years ago yesterday. We know what has happened in the 20 years since. But what about today? What about tomorrow? And what about the years to come? Considering this event, what would God have to say to us today? And what would God want us to do in response? What about then, September 11th, 2001, of the hundreds and thousands of images from 9-11 that have been burned into memories. 
One that stands out in my mind is a photograph of a simple handmade sign hanging from a building near the World Trade Center. And the sign contained a solemn promise. We will not forget. Certainly we won't. We can't. But when I look around and I hear the news and I witness the hatred among people in our nation, it seems like maybe we have. Have we? Forgotten? On September 11, 2001, our lives changed, our futures changed, the world changed. Because of the events of 9 of 11, <clears throat> many people, many of us, began to see the world differently, to see our lives differently. In the aftermath of those attacks, many people took the opportunity to rethink what they were doing, where they were going, and how they were getting there. They started to rethink their lives. The negative impact of 9-11 on the world was enormous. More than 2,900 people died in the attack. Countless families lost loved ones. More than $40 billion worth of damage was done. More than a trillion dollars in losses to the global economy was suffered. More than 300,000 people lost their jobs. The negative impact has been catastrophic. But looking back, it can also be seen that there were some positive things that happened back then in the midst of the tragedy. Just days after the attack on America, President Bush spoke these words to the nation. He said, in the past week, we have seen the American people at their very best everywhere in America. Citizens have come together to pray, to give blood, to fly our country's flag. Americans are coming together to share their grief and to gain strength from one another. Great tragedy has come to us, and we are meeting it with the best that is in our country, with courage, with concern for others, because this is America. This is who we are. This is what our enemies hate about us, and this is what they have attacked, and this is why we will prevail. We learned some lessons hopefully. But in those days, right after the attacks, we did learn lessons. And in the few years afterward, in the wake of 9-11, lessons that we must not forget. We had opportunities to develop a clear perspective on some crucial issues, such as what is important, who is important, and what should we be doing with our lives. Friends, we must not forget the lessons that we learned in the weeks following 9-11. As a church and as a nation, I believe we developed a better perspective in three key areas. As we ask ourselves, what about then? We'll look at these areas. First of all, we cannot forget, we must not forget what we learned about priorities. None of us will forget, as I said, where we were on September 11, 2001. The question is, where are we now? Where are we now? Did those days of disbelief and rage and tears and hugs and anxiety lead to lasting change? Has it? Men's Health Magazine in the September issue 2002 had an article 
about the upcoming 9-11 anniversary back then. It asked the same question that we have to ask ourselves today. Did these years following the attacks lead to lasting change? Listen to what some of the comments that they, people wrote in to the magazine in response to the survey. Michael wrote, I still complain about bills, work, and taxes, but now every morning I hug my two kids goodbye, and every evening I give them a kiss when I get home. Mark wrote, I am trying to take a more positive attitude. I've definitely become less aggressive driving. Adam wrote, everyone killed or injured started that day like any other not knowing they may not come home. Now, I try to get the most out of everything and not get caught up in the details that ultimately don't matter. Gary wrote, I make it a point to listen to my wife every day as she tells me about her day. After more than 30 years of marriage to her, I find I love her even more. Ken wrote, September 11th taught me that my life work should be about my daughters and building a family. I've learned that there's much more to life than just making a buck. September 11th gave us all an opportunity to rethink our priorities. People who go through tragedies Learn what is truly important in life. It gives us a chance to rethink the way we live. Another survey in the years following the tragedy reported that a majority of teenagers said that since 9-11, they have spent more time with their parents and family members, that they used to, more time than they used to with their family. We began relearning an important lesson about our priorities, about what is really important in life. It's a lesson that we cannot forget. The people in our lives are more important than our career or our possessions. People matter. People matter more than anything else. Paul said in verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For those who love their fellow men and women have fulfilled the law. Paul is reminding us that it's, it's not the things that we accumulate that give life. And they don't bring meaning to life. It's the relationships that we nurture that matter the most. Let's not forget what we've learned about our priorities. Loving the people that God has placed in our lives. That's what matters the most. Secondly, we must not forget what we learned about sacrificial living. Like... <clears throat> His brothers and his father, Mike Kehoe, was a New York City firefighter. He responded to the call on September 11th and went to the World Trade Center to rescue lives. As people were rushing down the stairs to get out of the burning tower, Mike was seen climbing up the stairs. Somewhere around the 28th floor, someone took his picture. And in that picture, you can see a crowd of civilians going down the stairs. Well, this dedicated servant is moving up the stairs against the flow of traffic. The photograph, which was widely circulated, earned him the label hero. But as far as he was concerned, he was just doing his job. Unlike many of his friends, Mike survived 
And in the weeks following, he worked many 24-hour shifts atop the rubble of Ground Zero, putting body parts and debris into five-gallon buckets. In Mike Kehoe, we see an example of sacrificial living. And in him, we see what a hero really is. There were countless acts of heroism on 9-11. Some of the stories we've heard and others we will never hear. Some of the names we have learned and others we'll never know. Some of the 23 cops, 37 Port Authority officers and 343 firefighters who lost their lives that day taught us a lesson in sacrificial living. And they taught us what a true hero really is. 20 years later, it seems it's still impossible to consider a man a hero just because he can hit a baseball or break away from a tackle. We have seen true, real heroism in action. And you know what it consists of? Sacrificial living. We saw sacrificial love in action. It's sacrificing your own safety for the sake of someone else. Because of 9-11, I don't think I've been able to look the same way at a police officer, firefighter, paramedic, or any soldier the same way. They are heroes. But they aren't the ones and the only ones. Thousands and thousands of people gave sacrificially in response to the crisis. Many rescue workers, many have contracted cancer and passed on since then, but they labored days on end without pay in an effort to locate survivors. People from all walks of life volunteered their service in whatever way possible because they wanted to help. Many people learned again the lesson of sacrificial living. It's what Paul made reference to in Romans, when he said, for they who love their fellow humans have fulfilled the law. Jesus said it this way, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are called, called as Christians, disciples, brothers and sisters in Christ, humans that care and love. We are called to sacrificial living, sacrificing for others. Yes, even if it costs us our lives. That's what true heroes do. It's a lesson that we learned on 9-11, and it's one that we must not forget. And thirdly, we must not forget what we learned about our mission in life. <clears throat> For a few weeks after the attacks, America came together in unity. Republicans and Democrats cooperated with one another. The media refrain from taking cheap shots at the president. And people from all backgrounds joined hands to meet the challenge that we faced. It was only temporary, but it was great while it lasted. During that window of time, however, we got a glimpse of how great it can be when people live together in unity. Unfortunately, it takes a tragedy, but we can live together in unity. Even though we have different political views, we saw 
that we don't have to live in a world of political sabotage. Even though one of the <coughs> foundations of freedom is the freedom of the press, we learn that the media doesn't have to be antagonistic to do its job well. Even though this nation is a melting pot consisting of multiple races, racial heritages, we learn that when we stand together as one people, we truly are indivisible. Though, many, though some may have <coughs> returned to business as usual, as God's people, we cannot allow ourselves to forget the value of unity. Paul said, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. King David said, how good and how pleasant it is when people live together in unity. How good and how pleasant it is. So what about now? What about now? In the past 20 years, we've become our own worst enemies. This pandemic has caused isolation and frustration, political divides, and breeded hatred, racism, Nationality, nationality, economic crisis, and gender differences cause us to hate one another, to alienate one another, and fence our neighbors out, and mistreat our brothers and sisters. It's as simple as this. God wants us to get along with one another. God wants us to get along with one another to live in love, to live in unity. After 9-11, we learned how to put our differences aside and join hands with one another in love, to serve a common cause. So what about now? Let's not forget how to do this. Let's not forget that this is at the heart of our call in following Christ. In today's text, Paul said, the commandments are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's powerful. Think about that. What we've learned about our mission as a people is that we are here to love one another. Love is the fulfillment of the law. We are here to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's what God desires of God's people. Shortly before his death, Jesus prayed this prayer. He said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me to be in complete unity. What about now, 20 years later, in the midst of this pandemic, what is God calling us to do? What is God calling you to do? One of the calls that God has put on our lives is the call to forgive. And I know that when it comes to 9-11, that's difficult. And I know some people don't want to hear about it. The first time that the word forgive appears in the Bible 
is in Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 to 21 that you heard today. Joseph's brothers didn't deserve forgiveness and they didn't deserve mercy. In fact, they deserved to be taught a lesson, but Joseph chose instead to be reconciled with them. Christian writer C.S. Lewis once said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. It's true, isn't it? That's because it's not easy to forgive. It's not easy to let go of an offense. The problem is that the longer we hang on to that offense, the more it destroys us. We've seen hatred, hatred towards ethnic groups and races in response to these attacks. People had hatred toward Asians after Pearl Harbor and then Arabs following the attacks of 9-11. The problem is that when you refuse to forgive and choose instead to hang on to that hatred, it becomes impossible for you to move on. You remain a victim all your life. When it comes to forgiveness and our attitude toward our enemies, Jesus spoke in very plain language. He said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. Jesus also said, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your sins. For if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. It can't be said any plainer than that. When you refuse to forgive, you find yourself separated from God. You find yourself carrying a burden that you don't have the strength to carry. You find yourself living the life of a perpetual victim. Forgiveness is a prerequisite to victory. That's why we are called to forgive. Forgiveness is our first calling from this. What about now? What about now? We're also call, called to be overcomers. We're called to overcome. One of the most difficult adjustments that we made after 9-11 was the decision to move forward with our lives. There was a tendency to wait because we knew the transition was going to be difficult. Do you remember the day that the stock market reopened? The Dow dropped about 1,400 points. There was a lot of fear in the air. It was difficult to resume some of the things that we wanted to and had done. We couldn't watch comedians or sitcoms. We didn't feel like going to a ball game or having friends over for dinner. The idea of moving on with our lives was very, very difficult. But it is in the moving on that we find the strength to overcome adversity. No doubt our enemies intended to hurt us 20 years ago. And they did bring a lot of pain to our lives. For some, it ends there. They have spent the last 20 years, for some it ended there. For others, they spent the last 20 years blaming and complaining. It was Bush's fault. It was the fault of the American foreign policy. It's the fault of Islam. 
It's the fault of Arabs. It's the judgment of God on us because America is soft on morality and we don't allow children to pray in school. It was a conspiracy and on and on and on. Some have used the terrorist attack as a target of blame for everything that they don't like about this world. But there have also been those who have said, yes, we've been hurt. Yes, we have been knocked down, but we will get back up and we will allow the power of God to somehow create good out of this situation. Even after 20 years, we have not yet seen the full redemption of God's redemptive power in this story. And we continue to trust that God will use this tragedy, use these events of that day to bring glory to God, to him, and to bless people in every continent, in every nation. The book of Micah says, do not gloat over me, my enemy, though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Micah chapter seven, verse eight. Though something like 9-11 was unimaginable for most of us 20 years ago, we couldn't even imagine or, or think about it. The truth is that we are not the first country to suffer a vicious attack. The question is, will we use it as an excuse to implode or will we let it be a challenge to stand taller and stronger and more united than ever before? What will we do? The choice is yours. So what about now? We have a calling to overcome. And we also have a calling to imitate. 20 years ago, we saw something special in American people. We saw hundreds and hundreds of people run to the battle in order to save innocent lives. We saw genuine love working among people, defining what a hero is. We saw it in guys like Mike Kehoe that I talked about and Todd Beamer, who helped orchestrate the attack on the terrorists on Flight 92, preventing the plane from reaching its destination. You remember his story, I'm sure, let's roll. Let's make this day a day when we remember them. The anniversary of 9-11 should not be about remembering the actions of our enemies, but about remembering the actions of our heroes. Because in them, we have an example to follow and a legacy to live up to. Just like in the story of Joseph, we learn how a person, a man of God, responds to adversity. The star of his story is not the misdeeds of his rotten brothers, but the shining example of courage and compassion and leadership with which he faced life. We are reminded of this in Hebrews. It says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Imitate them, imitate their faith. In the aftermath of 9-11, the world saw what true character of the American people ought to be, ought to be. 
they saw how we can come together in a time of crisis, how we can work together toward a common goal. The world needs to see the same characteristic in the church today. This community needs to see that same character in this church. When we learn to live together in unity, we will make a difference in the world around us, transforming lives and the community. Our mission is to love one another because love is the fulfillment of the law. Love one another. Why is that so difficult? We can't be sure about the future. There may be other attacks, other crises that we have to face together. Regardless of what happens, we can be sure of this. Our strength and our resiliency will be found in our ability to love one another. On September 20th, just after the attacks, President Bush spoke these words. What is expected of us? I ask you to live your life, to hug your children. I ask you to be calm and resolute, even in the face of continuing threat. I ask you to uphold the value of America. Today, my friends, I ask you to uphold the supreme value that God has called us to. Love, love. Look for opportunities to express it to everyone you meet. Never miss a chance. In the days following 9-11, when our hearts were breaking, we saw firsthand the power of love. We learned what it can do. And now, let our motto be, we will never forget. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh. 
Heal my heart and make it clean Open up my eyes to the things on the sea Show me how to love like you have loved me Break my heart for what breaks yours Everything I am for your kingdom's cause As I walk from earth into eternity Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Amen. Thank you for that, Chrissy and uh, Nancy. Thank you for the music today. Um, along with our service. Um, we are mindful of our, our responsibility as disciples in our giving. And I want to thank you all because it is in our giving that we are able to, to share that love, to show the community love, to do what God is calling us to do. And it does make a difference. So I thank you for your faithfulness um, in your giving. Um, you can give online or we have the, uh, the trays in the back of the room as you exit today. Um, you can give, and again, thank you. That We pray that God will lead us and guide us to use those uh, gifts to share that love, the love of Christ in the community with one another, to bring about unity. Uh, what, what a great legacy for a church to do. So we thank you again, and we bless these gifts to God's glory. And now as we go from this place, I pray that you will look for and see the opportunities to love, to share the love with one another. Let the legacy live on. The enemy doesn't win when we share love. Love overcomes all evil. Go in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>